12. Uh, but do what you can to get to 1 Corinthians 15. If you don't know where that is, uh, in the Bible, there's a table of contents at the beginning. No, no shame at all in using that. That's what it's there for. Um, so take full advantage of that. And I'm going to join you there in 1 Corinthians in just a moment. Um, but before I do that, let me ask you a question. Has anybody ever heard the name Carolyn Hopkins? Raise your hand if you know who Carolyn Hopkins is. All right. I don't think I see any hands, and I, I would actually be surprised if I did. Um, she, she's not really a famous person. She's a 76-year-old lady, uh, elderly lady, who lives in northern Maine. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's why I bring up her name today. Even though you don't know who she is, I am pretty confident that a whole bunch of you would recognize her voice. And the reason why is because for over 40 years now, she has been the female voice on the PA system at more than 200 airports worldwide and scores of subway stations all around the world. So just to prove this point to you, here's what she sounds like. Listen to this. Welcome to New York Kennedy International Airport. Welcome to Charles de Gaulle International Airport. While on the moving sidewalk, please stand to the right. Departure has been delayed due to... Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. There's an uptown train. See, I told you, right? I told you to recognize her. And now you know her name, Carolyn Hopkins. Uh, and I have to believe that Carolyn has to be probably one of those people that should win an award for being one of the world's most ignored people in all of the world, right? Like, do you ever listen to the announcements at the airport? No, you don't. Never, right? Uh, because at some point in the distant past, you made a conscious decision that everything that Carolyn is announcing, you've already heard it before, and it's totally irrelevant for you, right? So from that point forward, uh, you, you decided, I'm not going to listen anymore. Uh, most of the things that she wants to tell me are actually pretty, pretty obvious. It's like, Captain Obvious, thank you for telling me that, right? Uh, for example, every 45 seconds, she comes overhead and she's like, please do not leave your bag unattended, right? I'm like, thanks a lot. I would never do that anyway. I mean, the only people doing that are the terrorists, and they're not listening to your rules anyway, right? So, so she just has nothing really all that helpful. Uh, we've been convinced at some point that her information is irrelevant, and she's not going to deliver any news that we're going to find helpful that's going to improve our lives in any substantial way. And so what do we do about that? We tune her out, right? We ignore her. In fact, if you're like me, you probably pop in your noise-canceling headphones, and you actively turn her voice off so that you don't have to be annoyed by it anymore. Um, but what if in that airport with hundreds of people swirling around you, suddenly Carolyn's voice came overhead, and instead of telling you not to leave your bag un unattended, instead she called out your specific name. And she said something like, hey, John Tracy, I see you there in Terminal A, and I have a special announcement for you. You think that'd get your attention if she called you out in the middle of the, of the airport? Of course it would. You better believe it, right? Now you're perking up in a different kind of way because you've gotten a very clear signal in that moment that the information that is about to be shared is probably very, very relevant to you. Maybe you lost something in the airport and they want to give it back to you, or maybe you want a, uh, one of those free vouchers. You're going to get a free flight, right? Some kind of airport uh, competition or contest. But whatever Carolyn is about to say, it's, it's not generic information anymore. It's not irrelevant. It is of utmost importance, and you're hopeful that it probably has uh, the, the, the chance of improving your life in sub, some substantial way. And here's why I share that with you this morning. I have a fear as a pastor that some of us come into an Easter celebration service uh, like this one, sort of like the same way that we hear Carolyn Hopkins' announcements in the airport. That because this holiday comes and goes every single year, you know, that maybe for you it's become somewhat familiar and that it's lost all relevant meaning for your life. Like, like every year you drive past the church signs and you see your friends on social media posting invitation graphics to come to your church. And maybe you even do come over and join them in a church service. You've heard the Easter sermons before. Maybe you've even watched that movie Passion for the Christ or, 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 or some other you know, Easter themed television show. But truth be told, it's all started to sound to you like an airport announcement. Irrelevant information. That may or may not be true, but let's be honest, has little or no impact to your daily life. You've heard it all before and you don't really need to hear it again. So here you are today and why are you here? You're here to check the box that you went to church on Easter, but frankly, tomorrow the message that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead is not going to have any substantial impact in your life at all. 
That's my fear for you. And it's also my call to you this morning to unplug your ears and to not continue on in your life as if this message were not true. But instead to recognize that if, in fact, Jesus Christ really was raised from the dead, then actually nothing in the world could be more relevant to your daily life right now. And that Easter is not just a once a year novelty that you're obliged to hear about as some kind of a once a year token nod at religion, you know, that goes in one ear and out the other. But instead, it has the potential to change everything in your life, in your life both now and forevermore. And so we dare not miss it or ignore it. Here's the big idea that sits over our brief study today, as simply as I can state it, okay? This is the, the whole sermon in one single sentence. So if you're a note taker, write this down. There's nothing more relevant to my daily life than the resurrection of Jesus. It's universally relevant for all people and for all time, and it impacts every single thing going on in our lives. All right, now if the boldness of that statement has you sort of scratching your head a bit, you're like, like, come on, John, really? Like, there's nothing more relevant in my life than the resurrection of Jesus? Like, are you sure you're not exaggerating that just a little bit? All right, well, my job now is to back up that statement uh, for you by showing it to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, okay? This is a passage that a man named Paul, as in the Apostle Paul, wrote to a particular church in the city of Corinth. And the entire chapter is about the resurrection of Jesus. I already read a whole bunch of it to you at the beginning of the service uh, today, so I'm not going to do that again. But at this time, I just want to zoom in and focus on six verses in the middle of the chapter, verses 20 through 26. And I would invite you to follow along silently in your copy of God's Word as I read them out loud. Remember, as I do, these are the very words of God Himself. They're inspired by God's Holy Spirit. They were written down by His servant, Paul. They've been preserved and protected for literally hundreds of years so that you and I can hold them in our hands and submit our lives to them in the year 2024. So, Spirit of God, help us now as we look at your Word in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 20 says this, But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. These are the words of God for Keystone Bible Church today. So let's pray that his spirit would come, help us to learn them well, so that we'll be equipped to go out and live them well in the days ahead. Because again, there's nothing more relevant to my daily life than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right? That's going to be my primary task this morning, to prove that that statement is true. But before I even get to that, I want to also quickly ask you to notice some of Paul's arguments that are listed in the preceding verses that he's using as, as proofs that Jesus Christ's resurrection really happened. All right? He's using a form of, of lo logical argumentation that is called ad absurdum. Uh, he's using a series of assertions framed negatively in order to prove his point. For example, look at verse 13. If there is no resurrection, not even Christ has been raised. Verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And verse 18. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ, verse 19, we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But all that is building a case to actually prove his main point, which is exactly the opposite, verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. See that? So here's the point. I know a lot of people, even a lot of supposed Christians, who come to this time of year, and they really want to compromise on the literal accuracy of what the Bible says here. The truth claimed that Jesus physically died. It wasn't a fake death. He really died, and then he literally and bodily rose from the dead three days later. All right? For example, here's three common resurrection compromises that I hear about all the time. Some say, for example, that he was only risen in spirit, 
as in, you know, Jesus isn't really any different from any other person that died. That when he died in this life, it was his body that went into the tomb, but it was his spirit that went into eternity. But I'm just, I'm just telling you today, if that's what the Bible is talking about with the resurrection of Jesus, then what are we doing here, right? I mean, let's pack it up and go to the beach on Easter Sunday like everybody else. There is no power or hope for us if Jesus' body is still in the grave and only his spirit lived on. Other people say that the resurrection of Jesus is really just referring to him being risen in our hearts, that he didn't literally rise from the dead, but, but it was that he sort of lived on in the beliefs and, the, and in the hearts of his people. Like they'll talk about the Christ force or the, or the Jesus principle. Uh, no, that's not what happened. Jesus is a person, okay? He's not an idea. He's not some kind of inner presence. He physically arose and he is personally alive. Then there's a third common compromise that I'll hear I uh, actually read about this one just recently in Time Magazine. I don't know if you know this, but they publish a, an annual story about Jesus nearly every year, uh, right around Easter. You'll see it in the grocery store in, in the aisle as you go through to, to, to check out there. But Time Magazine said this, well, he's risen in the sense that his teachings live on. Oh, really? Like that's what it's talking about? I, that's not a resurrection, okay? Jesus is not just a creed. He's not a list of ideas and confessional truth claims. He is a real person, and he is alive. And here's the thing. If, you don't, if we don't have that, if we, don't, if we can't agree on the fact that he's alive today, then we don't have anything to celebrate here. Like, what are we doing here? That's the point that Paul is making. In fact, if Jesus didn't rise personally from the dead by his own power, then frankly, I have to tell you, he was a liar, wasn't he? Because in passages like Matthew 16 and Mark 8, he specifically said that he would rise three days later after being in the grave. So he either has to be alive or he was a liar and he was a fraud. He was a failure. Either he's meeting with us here this morning or forget about it. Let's go home. There's nothing else to do here. And let me just take a minute to quickly deal with the three-day thing, all right? Because, because some people are like, well, how can you trust the Bible's claim that Jesus rose from the dead if he can't even get the math right? right? Like we remember his death on Friday, but here we are celebrating his resurrection on Sunday. Like, like, hello, am I the only one that noticed that's two days, not three days, right? No, no, actually uh, the Jewish calendar starts each day at sunset and it ends each day at sunset the next day. And so in the Jewish mind, any part of a day was considered a day. So take a look at the chart on the screen. Jesus was crucified on Friday. He was in the tomb all of Saturday, the second day, And he rose on the third day, on Sunday. In other words, it's not referring to three 24-hour periods. It's referring to portions of three different days. That's literally what happened. He physically and personally and bodily came back out of the grave after being dead. And again, if he didn't, what are we doing here? Because he's certainly not God, right? God can't stay dead. That's part of what it means to uh, to be God, that he's eternal, Jesus said that himself, Revelation chapter 1, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. See, this is what he proclaimed about himself. So so if he didn't rise from the dead, then he's a liar and he's not God, which means there's no forgiveness of sins. There is no salvation. There is no eternal life. Get it? All the hope that we have in this life, and most especially in the next after our death, is utter nonsense if this is not real. Look again at how Paul says it in verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. See, all of Christianity hinges on this critical fact. There is nothing else to talk about if this isn't real. And verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. Like like what I'm doing right now is the biggest stupid waste of time in the world if Jesus isn't alive. The only only thing dumber than me preaching is you listening to me preach, right? You sitting through it. This is the pivotal piece. This is the centerpiece of all of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, personally, bodily risen from the dead and alive today forevermore. Amen? You say, okay, well... Well, that's fine for you. Like, like, you can believe that if you want. But, you know, like, I like to be honest about my belief system. And so I'm going to need a little more evidence than that. I'm, just, I'm not just going to take your word for it, John. All right, Mr. Skeptic. You've come to the right place because I've got some questions for you too, okay? For example, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you tell me, who rolled the 3,000-pound stone away from the grave? 
I mean, there's no, there's no debate or dis, uh, dispute historically that that's what happened. There's no record in antiquity, uh, some guy that would say, oh, the stone, you know, it never really was rolled. No, no, no. Everybody agrees. It was rolled away. So somebody did that, okay? Who do you think it was? You think it was the soldiers who, who would be killed for doing such a thing, rolling that stone away? You think it was little Mary and the other women on that Sunday morning? 3,000 pounds. Really? Is that what you think? I'm serious. Provide your strong answer, all right? Who rolled the stone away? And how about this? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, who overcame the guards and got his body out, all right? Think about it. A garrison of 16 trained soldiers to kill. You think a little fledgling group of fishermen came up with a plan in the middle of the night to do that on their most grievous night they've ever experienced in their lives? Come on, what's your answer? And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, who got, who got 500 people to lie for him to, to say that he actually appeared to them? That's what verse 6 said. You see it there? There were more than 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ, all of who claimed to, to have seen him and, and to have heard him talk to them. Who orchestrated uh, that exact lie in a way that they would all like believe it to their deaths? Don't, don't you think there were some skeptics back then too? Don't you think there would have been at least one of them who would have eventually gotten to the point where they would leak to the press and be like, hey, hey, here's what really happened, right? If there was some other plausible narrative or explanation. I mean, look at Washington. They, they try to do a con congressional inquiry. They can't get two people to say the same thing for two days, right? But here's 500 people who all claim to have seen the risen Christ. And there's not one written record of any of them ever recanting. Not one. And how about this? If Jesus didn't rise from, from the dead, who transformed the lives of these apostles from weak, fearful men into powerful, fearless messengers of the gospel? Men who devoted the rest of their lives and, and died their own tortuous, painful deaths with no recanting ever. How did that happen? Produce your strong answer, your reasons. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, who changed my life, okay? Who's changing lives all around this world, even in our day? And even right here at Keystone Bible Church, week after week after week, do you think we're making all this up? I assure you that we're not. Jesus is alive, and he's here with us even right now, today. Much more can be said about that, but again, my main task is not so much to convince you that the resurrection happened, but to try to convince you that if it did happen, it changes everything, and it matters more than anything. It cannot and it must not be discarded or forgotten or ignored. It must be embraced so that it will change everything in our lives. All right, so that's the main question. Why is the resurrection relevant? And I think Paul gives us three really great answers to that question here in 1 Corinthians 15. Three reasons that the resurrection is relevant for you and for me right here this morning in the year 2024 in Tampa Bay, Florida. Here's the first one. The resurrection is relevant because death is coming for all of us. Because death is coming for all of us. Look at verse 20. Paul turns the corner from arguing for the proof of the resurrection. And look what he says. But in fact, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. See that? And then he uses this really interesting phrase to describe it. He says, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. All right, those, those two words there, fallen asleep, are, are euphemistic for death. So he's not talking about taking a nap. <laughs> he's referring to followers of Jesus who these Corinthian believers had known personally at some other point in life who have already died and gone on into eternity. And the reality that we need to consider this morning is that one day, every single one of us is going to join them, right? Nobody escapes death. Whether you believe in Jesus or not, no matter how happy, healthy, young, prosperous, and wealthy you may be in, the, in your lifetime, the reality that faces every single one of us in our earthly existence is that one day it's all going to come to an end, right? We all will die. It is the inevitable destination for every single living person. So the question is, what are we supposed to do with that reality? If death faces all of us, what should we do about it? And, and, and I'm here to tell you, people have all kinds of different answers for that question, don't they? You probably know some of their answers. Like, like even in this room, we're going to have a wide variety of opinions about what we should do in light of the impending reality of death. Like some are working really, really hard to postpone death. 
You're working out all the time. You're, you're trying to eat clean. You're, you're taking vitamins and supplements, and you're starting every day with yoga and meditation and, and breathing exercises so that you won't be stressed out and anxious. You're trying to keep all the chemicals away from your body so that they won't poison you over time. You're drinking those green like kale smoothie things and you're eating vegetables and you're sticking your feet in the dirt so you stay grounded or whatever that is, right? All for what? Because you think that doing those things will give you a little better quality of life and hopefully a little bit, or a little bit more quantity of years of life at the end. You're trying to push off death as long as you possibly can. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things. I'm just saying that some of you are doing it so that you can have it as sort of a coping mechanism to not think much about reality of what life will be like after death. You're trying to extend this one as long as you possibly can. Others are convinced that that you really can't push it off. And so they swing the pendulum the other way. And they're like, well, if there's nothing I can do about it anyway, then who cares if I live, right? What matters most is just that I get all out of this life that I can. Every last ounce of pleasure, pleasure I can possibly experience in the, in the time I have left. So, so you've heard it, right? You only live once, YOLO. Like, like that's the motto of a lot of people. And so they just live a total hedonist lifestyle with no thought at all of being accountable in the next life for the way that you're living right now in this one. All you're thinking about is living it up right now. Maybe the most strange response of all to the reality of death is, is not just trying to postpone it or hoping there's nothing after it, but get this, some people literally try to cheat it. They try to cheat death. All right, now, unless you don't believe me, later today, when you get home, don't do this right now, but when you get home, Google the phrase Alcor Life Extension Foundation. Alcor Life Extension Foundation, all right? Alcor, when you look that up, you're going to be very troubled about the human race. I'm just warning you in advance. Because Alcor is an organization in Scottsdale, Arizona, where currently 227 people who have already died have had their bodies cryogenically frozen and placed into steel tanks in the hopes that one day medical science will advance enough for them to then be unfrozen and fired up for another round at living, right? People think this is possible. Actually, most of them have had their heads separated from their bodies, and so it's only their heads that are frozen in these tanks uh, because their plan is for their head to be attached to some kind of synthetic body or some kind of like artificial in intelligence robot thing, and they could be a head on a stick with, you know, powerful robot abilities. Like, like I'm serious. I'm not making this up. Did you know this existed? 227 frozen people plus a whole bunch more that haven't died yet who have already paid their quarter of a million dollars to have their bodies put in tanks when they die. Why? Because they don't want to accept the fact that death really is the end. It's the end of physical life on this earth. And get this, not only are there a bunch of human heads in there, like this is crazy to me, there's a bunch of heads of cats and dogs in there too, like animals that were pets. And if it couldn't get more ridiculous, there's even a chinchilla in there. What is a chinchilla? I had to look that up. It's some kind of like rodent thing. Who in the right mind would, would pay thousands of dollars to cut off the head of a rodent and freeze it in a tank, right? See, I, I say all that to simply make the point that we as the human race, we do not know what to do with death. And so we flail around with all of these different potential solutions and postponements, trying to delay it, trying to not have to think much about it, ultimately trying to escape it. But this text actually gives us a totally different way to deal with death. It tells us that we don't have to fear death because there is hope for us to live beyond it. All right? Look at verse 20, where it says that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does that mean? First fruits. Well, that's a phrase from the agricultural world, and it it's basically what it sounds like. The first fruits were a small advanced portion of the harvest that God commanded his Old Testament people to bring into the temple and to offer to him as a sacrifice. And they were to do so as a sign of trust that God himself would be the one to provide the rest of the harvest in due time. And this is how Paul describes Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He, uh, Jesus is sort of like the movie trailer that gives you a preview of what's to come in the fi film, right? A, li a little bit of the actual story that you will experience someday if you belong to Christ. And so you don't have to wonder what life is going to be like after you, after you die. That's, that's Paul's point here. You can actually look to the resurrection of Jesus and know exactly what's coming for you on the other side of death. And what is that? A physical, 
bodily resurrection to a new glorified body and an eternal dwelling place in the presence of God forever. That's what Paul means when he says that Jesus' resurrection is to be viewed by us as the first fruits. Understand? He's the preview of what's to come, and he's the down payment proof that there is eternal life available after death. But if Jesus Christ is the only one who can provide it, then those who are not in Christ have no such hope, right? That's why the resurrection is relevant for every single person here today, because death is certainly coming for all of us, and the only way to live in the presence of God after death is to be united to Christ so that we're raised to new resurrection life just like him. He's the preview of our existence after death, the first fruits evidence that all believers who have fallen asleep are now going to spend an eternity with him just like him, all right? So it's not just a religious fairy tale, the resurrection. It's not something that you can just dismiss easily and, and push away from your consideration. No, it's a historical reality that has eternal implications for every single one of us. That's the first reason it's relevant. Here's another. The resurrection is also relevant, number two, because sin is living in all of us. Sin is living in all of us. In verse 21, Paul addresses the reason why the friends and the loved ones of these Corinthian believers had to fall asleep or die, right? He says, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So that's at the same time uh, very bad news, but it's also very good news, isn't it? In fact, you know, it is the context of that really bad news that makes the good news shine so brightly and so, and so good. Here's the bad news. Sin is the cause of death. All right, now I seriously doubt that anybody in here would argue over that fact like out in the macro in the general sense, that something is wrong with the world that we live in. I mean, I doubt any of you would argue that point. Like we just look around, we, we watch the news, we see ample evidence all the time. Like I don't think any of us are, are going to be like, you know, this is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Everything's perfect in the world, right? From my vantage point. No, when we, when we hear of horrific natural disasters that take the lives of people in a, in a tornado or a hurricane or, you know, a tsunami, an earthquake, whatever else. Like, we know instinctively something's wrong in the world. That's why we grieve when those things happen. When we, when we hear about incurable sickness, plague, disease, whether it's cancer or, or dementia or heart attacks or, you know, on and on, like, the best of the best medical minds have not been able to solve these things. Diabetes, tur tuberculosis, strokes, like, like there's so many of them. We know this is not the way that life is supposed to be. That's why we're trying so hard to find a cure. When we hear of horrific acts of violence, school shootings and terrorism and war, we know the world is broken, right? But here's the thing. We radically disagree about why that's the case and where the blame should be assigned and what we should do about the problem. We want to point the finger at somebody, but we don't know who to point it out. We, we radically disagree on that. Why do we experience so much pain? Why will I face death one day, as will every single other person that I have ever loved in my life? In the early 1900s, uh, the London Times, one of the most historic newspapers ever, asked several authors to write essays in response to one single question. The question was this, what is wrong with the world? And they wanted them to respond in prose with lengthy articles. But one author named G.K. Chesterton submitted his entire essay with only four simple words. And they were these. Dear sirs, I am. And then he signed it, yours, G.K. Chesterton. He was right, wasn't he? What's wrong with the world? I am. And so are you. And the reason Chesterton said that because, is because he was a Christian. Is because he had read his Bible and he understood that the problem with the world is not something out there in the theoretical somewhere. It's actually a problem that's right here on the inside of every single one of us. All of the brokenness and all of the death in the world is not the result of some broken system in which we are simply victims. The brokenness and the death in the world is because of our own sinful rebellion against the Creator. It is our sin as creatures made in the image of our Maker 
that has fractured the cosmos and separated us from a holy God. That, that's what originally brought all this brokenness into the world. This isn't the way that God originally made it. He didn't do this. We did this, right? You say, well, what do you mean exactly? Because I'm thinking real hard, and I don't remember any time in my life when I joined in in, in some kind of like act of rebellion against the creator of the universe. That sounds pretty intense, John. Well, Paul wants you to understand in verse 21 that your family tree actually began with the first, mo- first man that God ever created, and his name was Adam. You see it there? He talks about this a whole lot more over in Romans. R- Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. See, this is the story of the family tree that you and I were both born into. We are the great, 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 great grandsons and granddaughters who have descended from this man, Adam, his lineage. So as a result, his story is our story. And his story is that one day he was in the perfect garden that God made for him to live in with his wife, Eve. And God said, if you break my command, you will die. And instead of obeying God, Adam broke that one command and he sinned against that holy God. And as the first representative of the entire human race, when he received the consequence for for sin, which was death, that death then spread for all of those who would come after him, including you and me and everybody else that has ever descended from Adam's family tree. That's what Paul is saying here. We're all born into a broken existence because of the consequences of sin. That's our greatest problem. That's what's wrong with the world. That's what's wrong with all the people in the world. And it's why we will all die one day. And before you object to that, and you're like, well, that's not fair. Like, why would would God do that? Why would God hold me accountable for what Adam did all those years ago? Well, Well, first of all, I would say to that, that if I were God, right, and I gave the human race one single command to obey, and they obeyed that one command, I'd probably be like, okay, you know what? Forget it. I don't need you anyway. Let's just eliminate you right now. We'll just push the delete button. We'll start over again. We'll roll this whole thing back, which would mean that you and I would have never had a chance to live in the first place. Understand? The surprising thing is not that there's only one way to avoid the consequence of death through faith in Jesus. The surprising thing is that there's any way at all. But not only that, let's be honest. We don't just inherit a sin nature from Adam as if we wouldn't be guilty ourselves if he had not screwed up in the garden all those years ago. No, we participate in this plan with our own sin every single opportunity we get. From the time that we are born, we start raising our fists in rebellion against every example of authority in our lives, and we willingly participate in sin ourselves. And as such, just like Adam, we stand personally and individually Condemned before a holy God just like he did. Rightly condemned by God's holy standards. Now, I know this is heavy, and some of you are probably thinking, like, whoa, I thought I came to an Easter service, right? Like, I'm just here for the egg hunt. Like, when do we get to that? Are we supposed to be cheering and firing off confetti cannons? (laughs) Well, here's the deal. The, The glorious good news that we want to celebrate on this day is only good, as this text declares, if Jesus defeated the problem of sin and death. That's the whole point. And if we don't understand how bad the bad news is, we can never fully appreciate how good the good news is, right? And the bad news, again, is that we would be stuck eternally in Adam's family tree if not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the end result of you and I receiving the just condemnation for the consequences that our sin nature deserves, the sin that we've both earned and inherited throughout our lifetimes. But the good news is that Christ Uh, went before us in death, and that through faith in him, the only one to ever live the sinless life that you and I never could, the only one capable of dying a substitution death in our place, those of us who are guilty as sinners, the only one who is powerful enough to rise bodily by his own power from the dead, now says that if you and I will repent of our sins, And we'll place faith in Jesus as the only hope for eternal life after our own death. We can be plucked out of Adam's family tree. And we can be placed eternally into Christ's family tree. You can be transformed. 
now and forever from what you have earned and participated in, and you can be given a grace that you could have never earned or participated in on your own, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, whether you came in today with a very impressive resume or a long rap sheet that would embarrass you for anyone to know about. Because of Jesus' perfect record of obedience and because he paid for your guilt on the cross and because he rose victoriously from the grave, you can now have all that he earned as your own. And you can have your guilt and your shame and your condemnation totally wiped out and washed white as snow, exchanged for the perfectly clean, righteous slate of Jesus as if you had never sinned at all. That's what Paul wants us to understand in verse 21. Look at it again. For as by a man came death, that's Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, that's Jesus Christ. And he's making it clear that those are the only two options in the world, friends, which again is why the resurrection is so relevant today. You're either still in Adam's family tree, and if you are, then no matter how many good deeds and good efforts you might try in your life, you're never going to get yourself out from under the consequences for your sin that you've already inherited in his lineage. Or you have been transferred and adopted into a new family tree, the spiritual lineage of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That's why the resurrection of Jesus is so relevant. Because it is the dividing line. It is the deciding factor that determines which family tree you belong in. It all comes down to this, to your relationship with the resurrected Jesus Christ. So if today you choose to dismiss, as many do, the resurrection as being irrelevant for your life, and you go on living your life as if it never happened, or if it did, there's really no bearing to your daily life, like you're the king or queen of your own existence. Living like there's no God in heaven to whom you're going to give an account for every action and word and attitude that has flowed from your heart. Then the tragedy of that reality is that you will remain firmly and squarely placed in Adam's family tree, still in your rebellion, still in your sin, still without any hope to experience resurrection life after your death. But if today your only hope is in the resurrection of Jesus... And if you will, give yourself and give your life to trusting him and following him for the rest of your days, obeying what he says, then you can be transformed into his family tree. And his death on the cross will pay the penalty for your sin. And instead of a, an eternity of judgment and consequence waiting for you after death, you'll be able to cling to the promise of forgiveness and eternal life forever. That's why. The resurrection is so relevant because it is what makes a way for us to be transferred from one family tree to another. It's what makes a way for our sin to be remedied. And Paul gives us one more. The resurrection is relevant because death is coming for all of us, because sin is living in all of us, and finally because Jesus is coming, don't miss this, to rescue some of us. Some of us. We just got told in verse 22 that all in Christ will be made alive. But it's not going to be chaos, and it's not going to be at some random time or some random selection. God is a God who keeps an ordered calendar, and there's a very important event that is next on his agenda. Notice what he says. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruit, so there's that same illustration again. He's the preview. He's the down payment. But then look, then... At his coming, underline that, those who, next three most important words, belong to Christ. Belong to Christ. Now, behind those three words, at his coming, is a massive amount of teaching from the New Testament that we don't really have time to deal with today. But teaching about the fact that Jesus Christ, having already come once as Savior to initiate and inaugurate his eternal kingdom through his life, death, and resurrection in order to save the citizens of his kingdom from the consequences for the sin, he, he is now preparing for another moment when he will return again. This time, not to inaugurate his kingdom but to consummate his kingdom, to raise the living and the dead of all the ages to face one of only two experiences in the afterlife. They will either be raised to receive his judgment or they will be raised to receive his grace. 
It was the only two choices. And that's the next event on God's calendar. Jesus is coming back, and the curtain is going to fall on everything that we've ever known or experienced in this sin-cursed planet. The credits are going to roll, and all of history as we know it will be over forever, and everyone who has ever lived will stand before the resurrected King Jesus to give an account for the life that they lived. Look at verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed will be death itself. You looking forward to that day? See, this is what God tells us is going to happen. So listen carefully. This same Jesus who lived as a servant, who died as a substitute, and who has been raised as a victor, guess what? He's coming back as a king. He's coming to rule and reign. And there will be no question on that day who he is or what his role is, how it is to occupy our hearts. The Bible teaches that the clouds are going to split and the trumpet is going to sound. And guess what? The Lord is going to descend. That's a real moment coming. It says that every eye will see him. Every every knee will bow before him in full acknowledgement that he is indeed the Lord of lords and King of kings forever. That day's coming. Doesn't matter how you feel about it. Doesn't matter if you want to think about it or not. The promise is that Jesus is returning. And here's why that matters. I don't don't know how much you think about the return of Jesus. You know, maybe not at all. Maybe not ever. But, But if we're thinking rightly and biblically about it, then there's going to be only two appropriate emotions and attitudes for us to embrace as we anticipate and wait for the return to happen. Either we should anticipate his return with joy because he's coming as our savior and our king or we should anticipate his return with dread. Should we not? Because reality is he's coming as your judge. Those are the only two options. And the Bible from cover to cover is unapologetic and unafraid of putting all of humanity into one of those two categories. Here's the phrase that Paul uses to say that right there at the end of verse 23. Those who belong to Christ. There's no wiggle room in that, see? All will face him in the end. But he's not coming to rescue and redeem all of humanity. Don't ever believe that. He's only coming to rescue some of us. Only those who are found in Christ. For the rest, he's coming to judge and to punish. Which begs the obvious question. Are you one of the ones who belong to him? And pay careful attention to the way I ask that question, because I'm not asking if you know his name. I'm not asking if you went to church on Easter or Christmas. I'm not asking if you prayed a response of prayer or walked an aisle in a church service or raised your hand to say yes to whatever the pastor was asking you to do. I'm not asking if you got baptized as a baby or if you took your first communion or if you tried really hard to live a good moral life and do good things for other people, hoping that in the end your good's going to outweigh the bad. Good plan or bad plan, church? It's a bad plan. No, I'm asking one simple question in response to the clear teaching of 1 Corinthians 15. Do you belong to Jesus? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord and your king? Is he your friend? Do you have a real relationship with Jesus? Is he the God of your life to whom you're submitting everything going on in your existence? Your only hope in the next one. Like if he's wrong, we're hopeless. We got no backup plan. Because if the answer to that question is yes, I do belong to Jesus because there was a time in my life when I was moved from the family tree of Adam to to the family tree of Christ by repenting of my sin and choosing by faith to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. Then the reality is that you can joyfully say with the apostle John, as he wrote in the end of the book of Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly, come and make it all right. I can't wait for you to come back to collect your people so that we can rise with you and be like you to an existence that is totally different from everything we've ever experienced here without any of the effects of the the brokenness and the consequences for sin that we see living in this world. I ask you again, friend, do you belong to him? See, maybe that's why God has you here today. Maybe that's why he orchestrated the events of your life. Like like you could have gone to any church today, right? Right? 
You could have gone to the beach. You could have hung out, hung out at some brunch somewhere in a, for an Easter breakfast. You could have done any of those things, but why are you here? I don't think that's a coincidence. I think God wants you to know that if you have not yet placed faith in him, then you do not belong to him. But there's still time. But you should not delay. Because if he should return without you belonging to him, then you will stand condemned eternally, bearing the full weight of paying the consequences of your sin forever. And that imminent reality should be the most terrifying and dreadful scenario that you could possibly imagine. But the glorious good news of Easter 2024 is that Jesus is not in that tomb. He defeated death, and he's offering resurrection life to all of us here today. And the only reason he hasn't come yet is not because he's slow or he forgot. It's because he's patient. And he's waited a really long time so that more can come to know him, even you. So if right now you realize in your heart for the first time that you stand condemned in opposition to God because of your sin, then the resurrection has never been more relevant to you, has it? And I would encourage you to do as many of us here today have already done. Run to Jesus. Cry out to him. Prayer is just talking to God. Start talking to him even right now. Die to yourself. Give up on your own plans. Give your life to him. Start, start telling him right now that you want to join the rest of the believers here in committing to follow Jesus for the rest of your life so that all of his saving benefit and all of his forgiveness and all of his eternal life after death can be yours forever. And so that when he comes, you will belong to him. Don't wait one more day to call in the name of Jesus for salvation. Don't wait one more second to come to the one who lived and died and rose again in your place. Hebrews 3.15 says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Today can be the day that your name is moved from one family tree to the other. And I pray that every single one of us will leave this place feeling and knowing confidently that if death is coming, and it is, and if sin is still living in us, and it is, and if Jesus is returning, and he is, then what we need more than anything else is confidence that life after death is also waiting for us. We need a remedy for our sin. We need a reason for confident hope at the return of Jesus. And all of that can be ours and more because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ the Lord. So I hope and pray that you will know him today. And more importantly, that he will know you, that you will belong to him. Don't hear this like a PA announcement over the airport speaker. Hear it like the life-altering, earth-shattering news that it is. That Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins and is now risen to provide eternal life forever. Nothing could be more relevant to our lives than that. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you've not left us in the dark about our condition before a holy God. Thank you that time and time again throughout the pages of Scripture, you have made it super clear that this is not the way you created our lives to be with all of this evidence of sin and brokenness in the world. You made the world a perfect place. It was your intention for us to experience open fellowship with you uh, in your perfect green earth forever. We're the ones who broke this. But unlike us, that did not deter your love for us in any way. It's always been in your plan to provide a way of redemption for sinners to be restored to their maker. And the whole Bible is really the telling of that story. The story of how things were broken in the beginning. The story of how all throughout the Old Testament there was prophecy after prophecy of this perfect Messiah, this Savior who would one day come. It's the story of how God in heaven took on human flesh and came to the earth to live the sinless life we could never live and to die the atoning death that we deserve to die. But that's not the end of the story. And today we rejoice that that sinless Savior is no longer in the tomb, but that our Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of heaven, is alive and he's now offering eternal hope for all of us who would put our faith in him. God, this is the story 
that you want every one of us to embrace with every fiber of our being. And it is the story that should drive us out of this place on mission to live for you and to proclaim to the world that it is true. It's the most true thing about our existence. Would you impact every heart with this gospel today? Every ear that's listening, God, would you open blind eyes? Would you provide faith to receive? Save souls, Spirit. Do it now. We're lingering as you're moving. We're asking that your power would be evident and manifest among us. We love you, Christ. We can't wait to see you. Would you come get us soon? And all God's people said,